Okay, let's start. So, uh, in this lecture, uh, I'll discuss uh, about how you'll actually go about sizing transistors in practice in a more systematic way, right? And before we get to that, I would like to bring your attention to two parameters of a transistors, which are commonly uh, used for characterizing. Uh, firstly, let us say if I have a transistor like this, what is the intrinsic gain from the gate to drain? Yeah, GM R naught or whatever, GM by GDS. So this is GM R naught. Okay, let me push it to a side maybe. So this is the intrinsic gain. And what is R naught? How do you find R naught? From the operating point thing, how do you find R naught? One by lambda ID. So this I'll write it as GM. So one by lambda ID. So I'll write it like this. Okay. So this guy here, uh, this GM by ID is one uh, nice parameter. And if you think about what this guy is saying, it kind of gives you uh, an estimate as to what is the maximum GM you can extract out of a transistor when it is biased at a particular current ID, right? So in a way, loosely speaking, it kind of quantifies the, uh, I will say the power efficiency. By power efficiency, I mean the following. If you have to increase the transconductance, typically you have to increase the current. But if you know that the transistor has a large GM by ID, for the same current, you can get a higher GM. That's the idea, right? And uh, if you have a large GM by ID, what can you say about the intrinsic gain? That will also be large. So this also gives you some idea as to what is the gain of the transistor, right? And remember, uh, GM is two times the drain current by the overdrive voltage. So then what is GM by ID? So I'll rewrite it. It's basically two by overdrive voltage. <coughs> so it also gives you an idea about the overdrive voltage <coughs> or in other words, how inverted the transistor is. You know that if VGS is greater than the threshold, the transistor is inverted. So if overdrive is small, which means the inversion is not so strong. If overdrive voltage is large, VGS is very greater than threshold, it is strongly inverted. So it also gives you idea about the bias condition, right? And also, uh, just to make things clear, if let us say I have a transistor like this, biased at some gate to source voltage and some drain to source voltage, say it carries a current I1 and let us say it has some width W, okay? Let us say I take an identical transistor having the same dimensions, so I will say same width, I connect its gate and drain like this. So what will be the drain current in this transistor? No, no. Same current, right? I mean, same transistor, same VGS, same VDS. So it is I1. So the total current is I1. And as you know, this can be thought of as one composite transistor biased at the same VGS and VDS. And what is the width of this composite transistor? 2W. And the current here, as we just saw, it's 2 times I1, right? So this should tell you, if I have a width W, the current is I. 2w the current is 2 times i. So how is the uh, current proportion, I mean how is the current related to the width? Yeah. I mean of course you know from square law but even otherwise this is just logic. The simple th circuit scaling where you are putting things in parallel it has uh, direct proportionality. Now let us say here in this experiment I apply a small signal delta v at the gate. What will be the incremental current added here? Some GM, I mean, from drain to source, it's GM delta V, right? So, and what about the second transistor here? Same. So, if I look at the total incremental current, it's 2 GM delta V. So, here also I have the same 2 GM delta V. So, now we can make another observation for a width W, it's GM, 2W, 2 GM. 
So if I bias everything at the same uh, operating point voltages, what can I say about the GM? So now you see uh, GM is directly proportional to the width. Current is also directly proportional to the width. What can you say about GM by ID? It is independent of the width. Okay, so that's something I'll remark here. It is independent of width. So by extension, what can you say about GM R naught? That is also independent of the width because that is basically GM by ID times some constant lambda. So this is also independent of width. So by extension, I can also say ID by W, GM by W, they are also independent of width. <coughs> so let me actually put a column here and list down the parameters that we know which are independent of width. So first thing we know is uh, this guy GM by ID. Second is the intrinsic gain which I will write as GM by GDS. The current density and GM by W. Okay. Cool. So uh, there is another parameter I want you to understand. Let me go to that. So the other parameter I want you to understand is uh, something called the transit frequency. So the definition of this stems from the era of bipolar junction transistors, but it's still used with MOSFETs. The definition is this, say I have a transistor in common source configuration like this. Say I apply a small signal current at the gate, say it's I in office in the Laplace domain. So uh, I know that at the gate, I will have gate to source capacitance. I will also have gate to drain. And since the drain is incrementally short, I can put both of them in parallel. I will clap it into a single capacitor. So this, I will write it as CGG, which is effective capacitance from the gate to ground. It comprises of CGS, CGD, gate to bulk, everything but predominantly dominated by gate to source capacitance. Okay. Cool. So if this is the case, what can you say about the short circuit current I out of his? What the short circuit current I out of his? Okay, first of all, what is the gate voltage? Gate voltage is I in, yeah, I in of his by SCGG. So GM times the gate voltage is the gate current, sorry, output drain current. So the current gain, if I were to define for this, it is GM by. Now what, uh, what frequency do you think this current gain becomes equal to unity? So this frequency is called the transit frequency, where the short circuit current gain of the transistor becomes unity. Again, this is more relevant in uh, BJTs where you have a current gain from the input base current to the output collector current. Here it is not that relevant, but the definition is still stuck. And this kind of gives you an idea about the speed of the transistor, right? But note that, I mean, if the FT of the transistor is say some 100 gigahertz, doesn't mean you can operate the device till 100 gigahertz. But if I have two transistors, one with a higher FT, I can guarantee that the one with the higher FT can work at higher frequencies. So it's kind of a proxy for <coughs> finding the speed of the transistor, right? Cool. And you also know GM is directly proportional to the width we just saw. What can you say about the capacitance, gate capacitance? That is also proportional to width. So what can you say about this uh, ratio that is also independent of it. So let me list it here. This is another parameter. Right? Sir, how does omega t tell us about the speed? I mean, the point is, it, uh, rele it is relevant in BJTs, but here it is not that relevant, but still, see, 
the speed of your transistor is going to be determined by the parasitic capacitances right so this kind of implicitly captures that what i'm saying is if i have two transistors one let's say has 10 gigahertz ft other has 50 gigahertz of ft one with a 50 gigahertz ft could be operated at a higher frequency compared to the one at 10 gigahertz that's all but it doesn't mean you can operate till ft Well, I mean, see, it is all uh, kind of, what do you say, uh, what is it called, whatever convention, it, it, it's kind of legacy, you can think of it like that. Right? In BJDs, it made a lot of sense because there you actually have a current gain. So, it kind of stuck, uh, but still is a decent parameter, right? Cool. So, now, let's get on to our problem of design once I introduced all these parameters. So, now, if you recollect... When we were designing our OTAs, for example, the two-stage Miller OTA, first at a block level, we decided what GM's capacitances we need. And that gave you the GM for a particular transistor. And then to decide the uh, current widths and lengths, we saw we could either assume the gate capacitance or we kind of assume the overdrive voltage and proceeded. Let us say we assume the overdrive voltage. I know that GM is nu c o x w by l times the overdrive voltage so i can basically find the ratio w by l we assume the length and got the width right so this is nice but this kind of assumes that the transistor nicely follows the square law equation which is this guy so this has a number of issues firstly you can't nicely estimate what is this mu, COX, etc. That is number one. So, which means if you uh, get an estimate of mu, COX and then design the values, what you will observe is what you design for and what you get will be way off. Right? Secondly, the uh, important issue is this equation itself is very approximate. Right? As you guys know, this is what is called the level zero uh, model for transistor. So, we can make it better by adding this channel length modulation, blah, blah, blah. But this is again very rudimentary. In practice, we have higher order, higher order models, which are called compact models. And if you take a model file of a modern transistor, it can have hundreds and two hundreds of parameters. So, if you have to exactly design, you have to take into account all those hundred parameters and then design. That's going to be a nightmare. Right? So, let's see uh, how we'll get around the problem. But that said, Although this is not accurate, this gives you a good uh, design intuitions. That is, here I know uh, this equation predicts that my current is proportional to overdrive square. But in practice, it might not be V overdrive power 2. It could be, say, power something. But it still says if I increase the overdrive, current increases, my GM increases. That is one design uh, you know, intuition you get. Secondly, it also says the current is in, uh, directly, I mean, proportional to 1 by L. But again, in practice, it could be some 1 plus alpha. But the logic still holds good. If I increase the length, current reduces, output resistance increases. Okay. But uh, this also says proportional to W, which is actually correct. Sir, uh, numbers also depend upon both, right? So correct. <laughs> lambda will depend on length. So, that is why I told if I increase length, output resistance will also increase. But we can't say anything for the current. Right? No, no, I mean, okay, for a given current I mean, right? let us say, assume that the, okay, assumption is you are not, if you follow square law, it is 1 by lambda id. For a given current, if I increase the length, yeah. output resistance increases. Yeah. So, yeah, as we saw, this is not accurate. So, let us see how we can go about uh, doing our design. The idea is pretty simple. You might even think it is very simple. The idea is the following or let me start like this. Right? Let us say you are a, a circuit designer. As a designer, what are the parameters of a transistor that you are interested in? GM, GDS, etc. So, let me list down what all you might be interested. GM. Let us say the GDS because that decides the gain. You might also be interested in the gate capacitance. 
and of course the operating point is something you need so let's say id pgs or overdrive voltage vds and finally the physical dimensions which are so just to point out these are the operating point stuff and these are the small signal parameters so now let us say i uh, go and make a large lookup table wherein for each width for each different values of length and for multiple operating point conditions i go and save all these parameters that you need right yeah basically you sweep all the operating point conditions you sweep the dimensions and you store all the relevant parameters and you create a large lookup table then in your design you find that i want my transistor to have some gm you can look into this table that will give you a whole list of options so you will find that to get a particular gm i can have so many combinations of widths and lengths so many combinations of operating point you can pick one if you do this you are guaranteed that you will get the exact gm so that's a basic idea right and here if you were to generate this lookup table so if you think about it i first have to sweep the width to sweep the length and then i have to sweep uh, let us say the vgs vds and remember for a transistor you also have the substrate so vbs is also there that also determines the current so you have to sweep that as well so you have to sweep all five parameters and kind of save this so that's going to be uh, some task but if you think about it i am actually uh, required to sweep all five parameters here because the parameters that i have chosen to save in my lookup table they are dependent on all five parameters right so can you uh, think of a way in which i can create a similar lookup table wherein i don't have to sweep five variables but i can reduce uh, let us say by one variable yeah how do you do that yeah so like is pointing out the reason is i am storing all these and these are dependent on all these guys instead i go and save these these are not dependent on w so i no longer have to sweep w correct so now basically instead of uh, gm what can i save i can save gm by id right or i can also save gm by w it gm by d or gm by w that is giving information about the gm instead of gds what can i save gds uh, that should be independent of it i mean look at the parameters that we have seen so far gm by gds or you can also actually save gds by so you can also save gds by id instead of the gate capacitance what can i store gm by cgg instead of saving the current what should i save id that's the idea so this way you kind of reduce the number of uh, you know for loops that you will have to have right because you know these guys are only dependent on what all uh, yeah let us say they are dependent on <coughs> length vgs vds and vbs so you just have to sweep four variables now and get this lookup table so that kind of simplifies things and if you want to make your life even simpler you can kind of ignore this guy vbs if you want to reduce it one order further you can even ignore vds to first order i mean if i do that your lookup table is not going to be complete so if i ignore these two and uh, make lookup table only by sweeping these two guys then once you design you will find there will be slight differences that's all so the uh, idea is the following what you have to do is this oops copy all this so what you have to do is the following uh, you take 
first and nmos transistor you first choose a particular length that is the what i am going to do is sweep these guys right so i start with sweeping the length for a given length i'll sweep all possible vgs store it and do it. that's all so first i'll start with a particular length say l as some minimum length and then i go and sweep the operating point which is basically vgs vds and vbs and then i store all uh, with independent parameters such as let me write it again so gm by id i have uh, gm by w gm by gds gds by id id by w gm by cgg and so on again if you want to simplify things maybe to a first order you can ignore these two guys again that is not accurate but to simplify life you can do that and of course you are storing it and you are uh, you also store all the operating point also right the overdrive voltage etc because you are sweeping the operating point you store the operating point also along with the with independent small signal parameters so once you do it for one length you have to change the length so basically you repeat it for different values of length say two times the minimum length three times the minimum length and so on ideally as many different values of the length as possible so that you kind of exhaustively characterize the nmos transistor so once you do for nmos what should i do ah pmos is pending poor fellows so you also characterize pmos so that way the uh, transistors are properly characterized okay so and in practice basically to sweep the operating point you can uh, do it in multiple ways one way is to directly take the transistor just sweep the vgs here yeah if you are let's say only sweeping vgs you can directly sweep the vgs and store it or you can also do this here you sweep the drain current that will indirectly change the vgs again there are 100 different ways you can choose anything the idea is this you somehow sweep the operating point and then store this and one thing to have in mind is when you are sweeping the operating point the transistor should remain in saturation okay so that is something to have in mind make sure things remain in saturation sir so like vth independent of vth uh see finally in uh, real life everything is dependent on everything okay but how uh, how much it is dependent on that's a question typically it is not that dependent on width it yeah see finally in a uh, real setting everything will be dependent on everything right nothing is completely independent and uncoupled so the order of which they are related is the yeah. so yeah you when you do this you ensure uh, transistor is in saturation and also see here we know the parameters are independent of width so ideally it shouldn't matter for the simulation what width you choose for the transistor but typically don't choose a uh, minimum width because again uh, it turns out in practice the transistor behavior could change for minimum width sorry minimum width and for slightly nominal width and the properties of circuit scaling where we saw putting things in parallel these hold very good if you have slightly larger width right so usually <coughs> keep width to be around let us say 0.5 microns or 1 microns basically don't use very small widths or very very large widths suppose random one is 180 nanometer hmm. so can we increase it to 200 nanometer or yeah, yeah. 200 nanometer yeah yeah can double no no doesn't i mean i just gave an example you can make it 200 nanometer it's fine but 180 to 200 is pretty small change right it might not there could be slight difference because 180 to 200 is not that much 
so i mean it will not change so much but there will be a change right i mean there is no restriction i mean instead of choosing two times l minimum you can choose 1.5 times minimum length right i mean it's all up to you Uh, I mean, length is small, but yeah, width need not be small. Width depends on your design, right? Basically, length huh? Length huh? Length. Feature size reduces, meaning the minimum length in your process reduces. Mm -hmm. But width is up to you. Mm -hmm. Width you choose based on what I mean. In digital designs, you don't want to have longer lengths. Mm -hmm. See, uh, why do you want to have shorter lengths? I mean, see, finally, in digital circuits, you want things to be fast. If the length is small, I mean electrons have to travel shorter distance. <laughs> I mean that's all right. I mean that's how you explain to your you know like some someone who is non-technical, right? Length is smalling, distance is short, things will be faster. That's the reason we go to lower technology. But in analog, uh, that's I mean that's not the main goal. We want to have some other functionality. Cool. So I can show you some things. So this is how I. Uh, did an example yesterday to show you. So again, I did this direct connection for NMOS and PMOS and uh, swept the current and got the operating points. And in Cadence, you can actually save the operating points like this. I mean, you can print the operating points like this. You can get this online. There are a lot of resources. And you can see for each transistor, there are whole bunch of operating point that the simulator will give you. Like here, you can see CGG, right? Uh, drain current ID, GM, GM by ID and so on. Right? So you store the relevant ones. So I have stored GM by ID, GDS, IDS, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then I store it, uh, export it to a CSV file and then plot in MATLAB. Okay. So I can show you some plots. So here I am showing the plot of GM by ID versus ID by W for different values of length. So I think the length is increasing in this side, right? So this is again another plot of GM by GDS versus ID by W, again for increasing values of length. Right? So once you have it, let's see how you can go put and design. And for that, I'll take a toy example and ask you to design a complex circuit with that. So as usual, I'll take a simple example in class and make you design bigger circuits. Okay? I'll take our old friend common source okay fine yeah let's say it's m1 m2 let us say you're supposed to design this actually let me also copy all these guys you also store the old drive voltage so let us say you are supposed to design uh, this common source. Let us say I have a load capacitance CL. Let us say the given specifications are you need to have uh, let us say DC gain of uh, greater than 10 magnitude. Omega U let us say is uh, 2 pi times 100 mega radians per second and the load capacitance is say 1 picofarad. So let's see how we'll go about designing this using uh, this technique. So firstly, what is the DC gain here? I mean, okay, let me mark the inputs V in, V out. What is the DC gain? Let magnitude, yeah. Huh. Yeah, GM1, I'll just write in terms of GDS. So this is given to be greater than 10. Right. So now, can you say anything about GM by GDS1? I know GM by GDS1 plus GDS2 is greater than 10. Can you make any guesses about how should GM1 by GDS1 should be? Just some logical guess. How do you? At least should be twice. That is assuming if both GDSs are around the same value. Right? So, if let us say I assume this, then GM by GDS of transistor M1 that should be greater than 20. 
so for example let us say i choose it to be 25 nice round number so this i have used the first information about the first specification the second spec i have been given is uh, omega u what is the omega u for this circuit the unit gain frequency how will you find yeah beta but uh, i mean beta you don't i mean this is basically unity gain not unity loop gain so beta is not there a not times p1 first order system what is a not ha huh? gm by some output conductance right what is the pole yeah that is basically the output conductance by cl so what is omega u gm by cl right so i'll directly write it don't have space so omega u is gm 1 by cl that is given as 2 pi times 100 mega radians per second so i know the load capacitance i can find gm 1 so this so i think 628 micro seconds correct right? yeah so as of now i know the following information from the specs i have directly derived that gm should be at least 628 micro siemens and uh, i know gm by gds of transistor m1 is around 25 cool so now for this transistor i have to decide what is the drain current what is the width length etc so how do you uh, suggest we use this lookup table we have in uh, in these parameters that we have stored what is the parameter that we know we gm by gds right now let us say i want to find the current in the transistor what is the bias current needed i know gm i know gm by gds i want to find id so i can basically plot gm by gds and i mean i want to find the drain current id i know gm so what should be the parameter i look at here gm by id right in there is nothing here is just logic right so basically if i put a uh, plot these two guys i'll find what is the required value of gm by id to get this gm by gds that's all and if i do that yeah and remember uh, before that i need to decide the length right so basically i have plotting gm by gds versus gm by id for different lengths minimum length 2 3 4 5 i want to get a gain of around 25 so that's somewhere around here so what length do you think i can use here ha huh? minimum is enough i mean there is no harm in using longer length but minimum is good enough so i let us say choose the length to be minimum and this is the plot only for the minimum length ha huh. yeah yeah so i was there a big gap between and minimum that is just the how the process behaves i have no explanation this is an example pdk chose i mean i have no reason as to why there is this gap you are asking right i have no idea our reason i mean our goal is to not fix this gap see uh, this is you are you have been given something design with that so right i mean of course if you think in device physics you will be able to get a reason for this but <coughs> it's not good so we know that minimum length is enough so i am show, showing only the minimum length plot gm by gds gm by id so i have chosen 25 as the gain so that gives gm by id as 7.28 so this gives me let me write it here directly so this gives me that uh, gm by id 7.28 and i assume that the length is minimum okay and in the example pdk chose it was 180 nanometer and to give you more info the supply is 1.8 volts so from this i can find the drain current So drain current is 628 by 7.28. What is 628 by 7.28? It's 86.2. Okay, it's it's not like I'm good at uh, fast calculations. I did it yesterday, so I remember. So okay. So we could also find uh, using that expression that the uh, GM by GD is 
Uh huh. Correct. So how will you find it? By finding GDS. No, no. That point is you don't know. I mean, okay, you will find GDS then. Lambda ideal. You, the point is you. The whole point of this exercise is you don't rely on mu, c ox, lambda, blah blah blah, right? Because those parameters, first of all, the equations are very approximate. Estimating those parameters are going to be a pain, and that is why you do this. You do all simulations, get all operating points, store the values, just look here and get it. So now you know the uh, current. I need to find the width. So what do you think I should do? Yeah, I can look at. I know GM by GDS, GM by ID. I know the current also. I just need to find the width. So I can plot either of these two. Versus I D by W, right? And if I do that, yeah, here I have plotted G M by G D S versus I D by W for a gain of twenty five point five. I D by W is forty one point six. So this also gives me I D by W is forty one point six. So this gives me the width as around two micron. the point is i get told we are not uh, sweeping the we are sweeping the operating point right i mean the gr graph i got was for different operating point conditions right so uh, i for my for this simple example i did this swept the current here so that operating point changes and for each operating point i have stored this that's all right in all these examples when you swept the current the w was constant right? correct So in some in one of the cases we might have got the like right answer. We must have reached the that point on the plot that we want, right? That's the idea. I mean, you, you I mean, you are asking. Okay, can you explain? I didn't understand the question. I mean, uh, we have this graph. Correct. Oh, you are asking uh, in this graph. Let's say uh, I don't. I have only these two points. I mean, uh, uh -huh. from this we will get the value of W, right? A value of W which we did not input. Correct. I mean, so like all these graphs that we have obtained. The point is, we are getting a W uh, which we have not used because the parameters we have chosen are independent of W. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's the logic, right? Mm -hmm. If you uh, the reason why we are doing it is because the parameters that we are setting are independent of W. Doesn't matter what the W is. For a given GM by GDS, for a given length, this will be the required ID by W. Let's say I choose this is minimum length. If I choose a minimum length transistor, irrespective of the width, if I have GM by GDS of whatever 25.5, the current density will be equal to 41.6. Okay. Initial requirement is this. I chose I think one micrometer. I think for the simulation, right? One micrometer. Anything. Yeah, like I told, you can choose anything, but don't choose it to be really small and really large. Okay, so that kind of uh, finishes the first transistor. I know the length, I know the width, I know the current, but uh, things uh, thing doesn't. I mean, uh, things don't stop there because you need to make sure that the transistor VGS is such that it is in saturation, right? Because see here, uh, what will set the output DC here? Hmm? Nothing will set. It's again having like two current sources. So assuming that we'll have some feedback loop around this, that will set it. So let us say that will set to around uh, VDD by two, which is 0.9 volts. So we have to make sure that for this transistor, the VGS required is not so high that it is not in saturation, right? So after doing this, you also go and check what is the overdrive voltage, okay? Because that also is something you would have stored. So I did that also. For uh, I plotting the overdrive voltage versus I D by W, so I D by W was forty one point six. For this, I get the overdrive voltage as one forty millivolts. So from the operating point, you can find the threshold. I think here it's around five fifty millivolts or something. So what is the VGS? Five fifty plus one forty, it's around seven hundred millivolts. Right? So in this case, I find that the uh, VGS. <laughs> Is good enough because gate will be at 700 millivolts. Drain is at 900 millivolts. It's okay. 
so always uh, check for overdrive voltage i'll make it a point and ensure that things are in saturation Yeah, I mean this. How we are going to bias? I have not come to it because it's. I just wanted to give an example, right? You'll see. Yeah. The idea of this thing is to show you how we might design in practice. That's all, right? Don't worry too much about the circuit implementation. So now the second transistor is pending. Let's quickly do that. For M2, what are the parameters I know? Do you know anything about the? You know the current. Yeah, firstly, current is same as I D one, which is anything else. Yeah, you know the G D S. We have assumed both G D S to be same. So here, G M by G D S is twenty five. G M is six twenty eight. So six twenty eight by twenty five is around twenty five. Yeah, good. That's around twenty five. So now look at the uh, things we have. Which parameter do we know here? We know GDS by ID because I know both GDS. I just need to find the width, right? I can assume the minimum length. That's fine. So I know GDS by ID. I look at ID by W. That's all. So what was the reason for choosing a higher length? you tell me what do you think why do you think we'll use if i increase the length what all happens capacitance increases but anything else uh i mean that's okay i mean the output resistance increases right basically if you increase the length the effect of drain to source voltage on the current reduces that translates to saying the r not is higher that's all So once you do this, you can get the width. And here, I think I did that. Yeah, I think this GDS by ID versus ID by W, and I find the ID by W as thirteen point eight or whatever. I think that gave width as six point two five micrometers approximately. And again, uh, you should not stop there because you once again have to make sure that the gate voltage is sufficiently good enough so that. that transistor is in saturation so check for the overdrive voltage and ensure it is in saturation so here also i did that so what i did i plotted the current density versus the overdrive voltage i found the current density for the pmos in this plot so that is around what uh, 13.8 So for 13.8 uh, amperes per meter of uh, current density, the overdrive voltage is around 160 millivolts. Again, threshold you can find from the operating point that's around 550 or 560 millivolts. So the source to gate voltage is how much? Again, roughly around 700 millivolts, right? So this again I ensure that uh, things are okay. If you find that, let us say the overdrive voltage is not suitable, and that transistor will be not in saturation, you can do the reverse thing. That is, you can start by assuming the overdrive voltage, right? And then you do the reverse calculation. I mean, now it's all simple, right? You know these are the parameters you have. You know what are the parameters known to you. You just you know plug and play. You see what is the relevant parameter that you can use. Find the unknown parameter and keep doing. Don't do the reverse. The circuit making you get is always switched. Right? It's just one circuit, right? Uh, this guy. Yeah, I mean, it could be dirt connected or this anything. The idea is this following, right? You sweep the operating point somehow, ensuring transistor is in saturation, and then store these guys. That's it. So you do it for each and every transistor in the circuit. We'll have N MOS and P MOS, right? That's all. Oh, you know, but uh, for each and every circuit, you know, like for each and every transistor. Yeah, that that's exactly what you are doing here, isn't it? You are sweeping the operating point so that you are changing the overdrive voltage. Yeah. So gains will be different for each 
Okay. Yes. So the uh, VO drive should be different. Yes. Graph yeah. For an inverse transistor, it is the same graph. Yeah. As long as you change the length, repeat it for different values of length. Hmm. The idea clear? I mean, the uh, idea is pretty simple. Right? You have a huge database like Google having all the information. Whenever you want something, and go and look it and fetch it. It's not like some crazy idea. It's like pretty simple. Cool. So yeah, so that will fix the last guy. So one thing uh, is, so here if you get a width of 6.25 microns, typically you don't put a single transistor with width of 6.25 microns. The reason is, as, as I mentioned, uh, the in practice the transistor models they might not be very good or they might have some deviations for very small widths and very large widths. So typically uh, around 2 micrometers probably you can use a single transistor. If you want to get more than that you can put multiple of them in parallel. Right? Let us say for here I can put 0.5 microns or no 1.25 microns and put 5 of them in parallel. right? And typically uh, this is set using something called fingers. I will explain it later when we look at layout. So basically we have something called a uh, finger. Finger can be thought of as a single instance of a transistor. And here I have chosen the finger width as 1.25 micrometer. Can be thought of as one single instance. And then you can specify what is the number of fingers. That is the number of things that you are putting in parallel. As of now you can think it like this. Great. So finally let me wire up the circuit and show what results we got. So for simulating it I took this guy. I need to bias it. So what I did was the following. I took a diode connected thing like this. And then I just put this small signal here. This is only for simulation, right? So I am just did this. So uh, I also have to make sure that this guy is biased appropriately so that it carries the same current as I not, I mean as the NMOS. And as we saw earlier, you don't independently bias both the guys, right? But since this is a demo, I adventurously went and did that. So I basically did this generated the same, I mean basically I mirrored the same current here, did this diode connection and connected it. But if I do this I am basically biasing two current sources independently. This voltage will not be set properly. Again since it is a simulation to set it, I put a large inductor. Now if you think about what is happening, at DC inductor is less short that will force this voltage to VCM. Right? And for AC, if I use a very very large inductor, it is open, it does not affect your frequency response. Sir, a large inductor or a small capacitor would not be No, if you put a small, I mean the idea is I have to set the DC potential here. Mm -hmm. Because the way I have done it, it is not something you will do in practice. Mm -hmm. I am doing it only for finishing this demo, that is all. right? So I cannot set the two current sources independently. That is a danger, because this voltage will not be defined properly. So for defining this voltage, I put an inductor so that at DC it is direct shot. Okay, but sir, this same thing would happen for small capacitor. If you put a small capacitor, a DC capacitor is open, right? Okay, okay. I want to make sure that at DC the voltage is set correctly, mm -hmm. at AC it is not there. Again, this is only for showing the demo, I mean this is not how you will design in practice. Okay. In your case, you have the OTA, you put it in unity feedback and check for operating points. Because you put some negative feedback around the OTA and check for operating points. That is simple thing. Sir, can we place that inductor in that, uh, <laughs> connect with the gate of that CMOS? Uh, I didn't understand. Connect the gate and drain of the CMOS with an inductor. That should also be fine. Yeah, that is also a good point. You can <laughs> do that also. So he is suggesting this. I think this should also work. Put a large inductor here. So that at DC this is doing this, at AC it works, that is all the And why 
Uh, no, no, this is the small signal, right? I have to add the small signal to the DC. Again, for simulation purposes, I am doing it. Yeah, yeah, but I have this is the DC bias. I have to add the AC signal, right? I mean, uh, don't get confused with this. It's just for uh, simulating it and showing the results. So, let me show the results and we'll wrap up. So, this is the final circuit. I check the operating points and uh, when I do that, the expected current is 86 micro, but we get 90 micro. There are a lot of reasons. Firstly, because this current mirror will not be accurate because VDS is not same here. If you want to make this a better current mirror, what can I do? Let's say you don't want to do cascode. In this circuit itself, what can I do? No, I, I basically the current is different because the drain to source voltage is different. So I want to reduce effect of VDS on ID. I can increase the length. Here I use the uh, minimum length because that was enough for my gain. If you find that the mirroring is need mirroring needs to be improved, you can increase the length. That's fine. But anyways, and then I designed for 628 micro Siemens. I got 655. Again, lot of reasons because. I didn't uh, consider the effect of VDS while generating the lookup table. So that's why it's not correct. And finally, if I plot the AC response, uh, this is in de decibel, so it's greater than 10, definitely. 10 is 20 dB. Right? And if I look at the unity gain frequency, that's about 100 megahertz. Right? So, bottom line, uh, if you design it this way, using the lookup tables, what you finally get and what you design for, they will have, they will be almost same. And in, uh, and if you actually take into account the effect of VDS and VBS while generating the lookup table, you will get exact results. Right? So one last thing, so anytime you come up with something new, what is the first thing you have to do? Yeah, name it. So the guys who came up with this named it as GM by AD based design. Or you can also, it's also called as lookup table based design. Right? So, idea is you don't rely on all your square law equations, mu, c, ox, lambda, and all. Just generate a large lookup table. From your design, from your uh, specifications, you will get some parameters. You find what parameters of this is known. Look at the required parameters and find it. Let's stop here.